Good evening, uh, not so far, any excuse to get a bit of Welsh language into proceedings. Um, welcome to the first ever public lecture from the Open University's Research into Employment, Empowerment and Futures Academic Centre of Excellence. My name is Owain Smolvis-Jones, I'm Director of the Research Centre and we're totally thrilled to be joined tonight by Grace Blakely, who's an author, um, a, a writer and a speaker who we absolutely love in our centre and has loads of valuable things to say um, about the economy, about work and most importantly tonight about the environment. So um, these are clearly really difficult and challenging times for people, families and organisations. And tonight I hope we can provide a window of light and hope. These are difficult times, times of crises, but in these kinds of times, um, we, we can find possibilities and windows for exploring more radical ideas because these kind of times of crisis can shift the parameters of what we consider to be possible and impossible. And it's very much a paradigm shift in policy, organisation and consciousness that we need to adequately address the climate crisis, the biggest crisis that any of us will face in our lifetimes. And Grace is going to be pushing us to think and act a lot more boldly on that this evening. So, but before we get into Grace, just a couple of quick words about REEF, about our research centre. So we have a focus on very much on what the future of work will look like. And so clearly climate change and how organisations and societies adapt to that is an incredibly important part. But we're also interested in how issues of climate and adaptation and mitigation of climate change connect to future relationships at work, um, modes of employment, ownership and so on and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm a, a leadership academic primarily who looks at collective and democratic forms of leadership and you don't need to know any more about me because we're going to move on to uh, our special guest this evening which is Grace Blakely and we're going to have a slide on Grace now. So um, I, I've absolutely loved um, both of Grace's books so far. So Stolen, How to Save the World from Financialization, and most recently, The Corona Crash, How the Pandemic Will Change Capitalism. And there's a fantastic section in there on the Green New Deal, which she's going to expand on tonight. Grace has also edited Futures of Socialism, The Pandemic and the Post-Corbyn Era, which is available to buy on Verso. She's a staff writer at Tribune magazine. I'm holding in my hand the current issue of Tribune, where Grace has a, a really terrific article on um, a Green New Deal as a, a way of recovering from the corona crisis. Her previously Grace worked as a research fellow for the Institute of, um, of Public Policy Research um, and as an economic commentator for the New Statesman. Most of you will recognise her for her many TV appearances on Question Time, BBC This Week, BBC Breakfast and The Frankie Boyle Show. Um, OK, so we just need to say a couple of quick words about the Corona Crash, um, which is available to buy on Verso currently um, as an ebook if you want to be ultra environmentally friendly um, or as a paperback as well. So go directly to the publishers to buy it. I do heartily recommend it. I couldn't put it down. I read it in pretty much one sitting. So with no further ado, we're going to hand over to Grace and then you feel free to write any questions in the Q&A box. We will collate those questions and I'll put as many of them as possible to her at the end. OK, so over to Grace. Thank you so much for that um, really lovely introduction. Can everyone see and hear me OK? Yep, perfect. Great. Cool. Um, yeah, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, as Owen was saying, I am going to be talking today a little bit about some of the ideas in my latest book, uh, The Corona Crash, How the Pandemic Will Change Capitalism. Um, and do uh, post any questions that you might have in um, the Q&A, as Owen just mentioned, and we can hopefully have a, a good discussion about it at the end. So, um, the book starts by really looking at, uh, at um, how we went into this crisis. So we, we entered the uh, coronavirus pandemic with a fairly weak economy. I'd actually written a cover story for the New Statesman. Um, I think it was in uh, 2018, uh, looking at the potential for uh, uh, the next economic crisis, the next potential big uh, big crisis in the in the global economy, and saw a lot of potential weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Um, looking specifically at the UK, but these are also problems that we saw in many other advanced economies um, over the last 10 years in particular, there's been a, a problem of 
relatively high rates of, of debt, um, of private debt in particular. Uh, so obviously in the period before the financial crisis, there was a significant increase in um, household debt that was associated with uh, all the problems that we saw kind of explode in 2008. But in the period since then, we saw a really substantial build up in corporate debt and particularly um, risky high yield corporate debt. So um, corporate debt that is taken out by kind of, um, you know, less credit worthy corporations. Uh, we've also seen what economists have been very concerned about, which has been a, a long stagnation in productivity. Um, and so economists have ref been referring to this as a problem of kind of secular stagnation. Um, the fact that in many advanced economies, actually, productivity has um, stagnated even at very low interest rates. So even with central banks doing a lot to try and stimulate the economy. At the same time in the UK, we've seen um, we saw a decade of wage stagnation before the pandemic hit which is very, very stark. And it's kind of linked in with that problem of, uh, of productivity in, in quite complicated ways. Unsurprisingly, given all of those issues, uh, we also had rising inequality. Now, this is interesting because um, we were told for quite some time that inequality was actually flat and, and hadn't really risen since the 1990s. But a lot of researchers recently have gone deeper into the data and kind of collected different sources of data together and have actually shown that um, when you account for these issues of measurement, um, we've seen quite sharp increases in inequality over the last 10 years, both in terms of income inequality, uh, but also wealth inequality. Um, and those uh, issues of income and wealth inequality translate into lots of other forms of inequality, like regional inequality. We're one of the most regionally unequal countries in Europe. Also gender and, and race inequality as well. Um, and these are also issues that you see across many um, developed countries too. In the US, for example, the average worker is when you adjust for purchasing power about as well off as they were in 1979, which is a really, really stark indictment of um, you know, the, the way in which growth has not really benefited uh, most people in the, in the US economy. And the same thing could be said for the UK. So those issues um, at the domestic level there's, are also kind of reflected at the global level. So again, you know, we have this global debt bubble three times the size of world GDP, which creates all sorts of potential um, issues and problems that we began to see emerge um, when the pandemic uh, really started to hit the world economy. We are also seeing high and now um, potentially because of the pandemic rising inequality at the global level um, for a, a lot of different reasons. And of course, you know, the, the big exception to this is, is China, which is kind of um, growing and as it does so, lifting a lot of people out of poverty. But in a lot of parts of the world, particularly, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, um, where there are all sorts of issues, not least to do with climate breakdown, um, that are really preventing um, this, I, well, really standing in the way of, uh, of these countries ever catching up with the, the rest of the world, which is what a lot of um, uh, economists believe would happen, um, particularly in, in the wake of the, um, the fall of the Berlin Wall, that there would be a kind of form of globalisation that would allow the poor to catch up with everyone else. And this, of course, has not happened. And particularly um, over the last 10 years and indeed during the pandemic, the, uh, the problems um, of uh, the kind of low income trap uh, have really reasserted themselves quite substantially. And then uh, overarching all of this is the imminent uh, problem and the kind of very, very deep rooted structural problem of, of climate breakdown. Um, so, you know, we know that we need to keep um, temperature rises within 1.5 degrees and that basically our, our budget for doing that if we carry on um, as we are now gives us about kind of seven, eight years uh, before we exhaust that. And then we end up looking at much higher levels of, uh, of, uh, of global warming, which, you know, could create these kinds of feedback effects that um, scientists discussed in this report about a, a hothouse earth where all um, a, a lot of different natural systems that contain um, carbon and other uh, greenhouse gases start to to break down and you get these kind of really substantial um, rises in the amount of carbon that's being released into the atmosphere because of things like um, ocean acidification, uh, deforestation, all these different sorts of things. So this is a real kind of very you know sh uh, sharp and, and imminent threat and of course what we've seen over the course of the the pandemic is that when the economy shut down we did see a, a, an initially very big drop 
in emissions, but that was quickly reversed as lockdowns um, as lockdowns stopped. One of the potentially uh, more positive things that we'll talk about a bit later that we have seen during the pandemic is a, a well, actually not just during the pandemic, but actually over the last several years, has been a very sharp reduction in the costs of renewable energy. And going out of the um, of the pandemic, this creates a very, very strong incentive for actually thinking, right, the stimulus programmes that states are going to be doing really need to focus on transitioning towards cleaner, greener forms of energy. So all of those problems, debt, productivity, wages, inequality, climate breakdown, were um, substantially impacting uh, levels of growth, uh, living standards, um, all sorts of, uh, of, of issues across the world before the pandemic hit. Now, these challenges were partly due to the global financial crisis itself. Um, so uh, there was this issue of a kind of big debt overhang in the economy as um, private debt was put onto public balance sheets, um, as you know, the, the banks were bailed out. There was also a question of a kind of debt overhang for households who had taken out lots and lots of debt and then found themselves kind of saddled with, with that debt as the economy performed, uh, performed more poorly. Um, and uh, the, the policies pursued by both central banks and treasuries fed into that those problems and created new ones as well. So um, very low interest rates and quantitative easing, for example, uh, for a number of different reasons that I won't go into too much at the moment, but I talk about a bit more in the book, have increased wealth inequality, uh, basically because central banks were pumping money into financial markets that investors used to purchase other assets, sending um, the prices of those assets way above what you would expect given their underlying values. Um, so that can be said of, of equities, for example, of, of corporate bonds, but also of assets like housing, which obviously people you know need to live. So that question of wealth inequality has really been exacerbated by quantitative easing. Also austerity, which has um, you know, weakened the power of working people relative to capital and has fed into this problem of wages, which has potentially exacerbated the productivity problem um, because it's constrained things like infrastructure investment, because it's also uh, you know, constrained investment in what economists you know, quite bluntly refer to as human capital, because we've had cuts to uh, education, to local authority uh, spending, to healthcare, of course, and social care, which were really critical um, areas that were cut. Obviously, you know, no one could have known that the pandemic would hit, but this was something that was a key risk that was continuously being mentioned by uh, by top scientists was that a pandemic might come at some point. And yet, you know, we were we were cutting health and, and social care spending for quite a while before um, the pandemic hit. There are also a whole load of other um, uh, problems that really, you know, can kind of be traced back to before the, the crisis, but became quite deeply embedded over the last 10 years, um, including this question of, um, of monopoly power. Uh, so obviously the big kind of economic trend that a lot of people have been talking about over the last decade has been the rise of the big tech monopolies um, and the growing problem of corporate power. Uh, but that that problem of, of monopoly and of monopoly power actually extends beyond the tech sector into lots and lots of other sectors um, from, you know, agriculture to food production to pharmaceuticals to healthcare. Um, our economies become very, very concentrated. And again, that's something that has been exacerbated by state policy, both when we're thinking about central banks, who've again created lots and lots of money, which has tended to uh, um, to support wealth accumulation amongst those at the top, including the kind of wealthiest and most powerful corporations. And when we're thinking about the actions of the state itself, of, of, of government, sorry, um, and particularly around kind of, you know, uh, the, the, the neoliberal approach, really, that we've had to, to competition policy, which has just facilitated lots and lots of mergers um, and acquisitions and hasn't really uh, worried about this question of monopoly power. But now this issue of monopoly is very much feeding into inequality, um, you know, the, the productivity problem, uh, the investment problem, all of these different sorts of issues. Um, and another really significant factor um, that has come uh, come home to roost during the pandemic was uh, very low interest rates and money creation by central banks pushed a lot of capital into poorer parts of the global economy, a lot of which was kind of hot money flows, a lot of which um, represented borrowing by private institutions in foreign currencies only for that currency to zip back into the global north as soon as there was a crisis. And that is now what is um, you know, a central factor in explaining the severity of the debt crisis that is currently being experienced in the global south.
So this crisis hit a world that was very weak and brought basically the kind of very weak and limited growth of the last 10 years crashing down. And the only thing that has really saved the world from the pandemic has been more of the um, of the policies that were introduced that really weakened the economy before, combined with a little bit more state intervention, in some cases a lot more state intervention, but crucially, not often state intervention that is supporting the interests of workers, rather state intervention that's supporting the interests of big business. Um, and on, on those two fronts, you know, we've seen monetary policy more of the same. So very, very, very low interest rates, uh, kind of unprecedented levels of central bank money creation and asset purchases um, to get the finance sector going to make sure that big business um, is bailed out, to make sure that people can pay their mortgages, that local government can keep up with its debts. And we can really see the emergence of this cycle of um, indebtedness leading to crisis, leading to greater levels of state support for um, kind of private businesses. Because we, we had obviously the financial crisis, quantitative easing was part of the response to that. The aim really was to make sure that borrowing was very cheap and the asset prices could rise again. Um, and that has obviously led to a situation in which because borrowing was very cheap and there were some who were able to become very wealthy as a result of those increase in in uh, in asset in asset prices and could then um you know potentially borrow even more cheaply in order to augment their wealth uh we've seen again this problem of, of rising debt and that means that when the crisis hits you have this problem of right well if people can't pay their bills that's going to create all sorts of um, a kind of chain reaction in the rest of the economy. So central banks have to come in again and say more quantitative easing, even further interest rate cuts to the extent that that's possible and bail out those private actors who have really, you know, either been forced into debt in the case of households that can't afford to make ends meet because wages haven't risen or have taken out that debt in order to increase their wealth, as is the case for, you know, big monopolistic corporations or, um, you know, or wealthy individuals. Uh, so you can see the way that that is creating this kind of self-reinforcing cycle of debt and bailouts that we're going to continue to see after this crisis is done. But the other big trend, of course, as I mentioned, has been, you know, everyone is saying the state is back. Um, so the state is intervening in the economy again. Austerity is dead. States are spending lots and lots of money. So, you know, that basically means that climate um, breakdown and inequality are going to end because we're going to see big green new deals. We're going to see lots of stimulus spending. And the problem, I think, with that is it's, it is just profoundly misleading because it kind of misunderstands the um, the power relations upon which uh, capitalist states so states that um, exist in order to sustain um, the kind of economies of, uh, of capitalist societies, um, it, it misunderstands why they behave the way they do, why they act when they do and, uh, and how they act. Um, because when you really look at what's happened, we've seen governments intervening in order to save capitalism and to try and basically piece back together the status quo, a status quo that was fundamentally broken, but which was also supporting the interests of a very small percentage of the population. And you can see this um, with the way in which state intervention has been conducted in the UK, for example. There's been a clear hierarchy of intervention. So first, uh, the central bank was uh, was the first to, to announce big, um, big measures, um, uh, you know, asset purchases and, you know, in the UK actually direct monetary financing ultimately of, of state spending. Um, and the the, you know, actors that that served to benefit initially were um, was the finance sector, which was, you know, really needed a lot of, of liquidity pumped into the system in order to just make sure that contracts could be kept. And we didn't have this problem that we saw in 2008 of one institution potentially not being able to service its debts and that having an impact on, on lots of others. Business, again, because of that big rise in, in private debt, um, central banks acted very quickly to make sure that big businesses uh, would be able to honour their debts. Then we saw some intervention for mortgage holders. Um, so mortgage payments were freezed. Um, we also saw some support for small businesses. And at the end, we had some support for those who were formally employed, you know, who had kind of formal contracts and were therefore able to take part in the furlough scheme. There was little or nothing for um, many workers who are um, either informally employed or self-employed or precariously employed um, and excluded UK has been doing some interesting work looking at people who've basically not been able to receive any support even though they haven't been able to work during the pandemic. 
no support for renters really other than the eviction ban but you know that doesn't really solve the problem it just kicks it down the road and just a kind of very small increase in universal credit for the unemployed which looks as though it might be taken away again so you can really see the way in which state intervention has been structured to support the interests of first the kind of um capitalist elite basically that the state is reliant upon um, to keep the economy going but then also key voting constituencies which have again been the ones who've benefited the most from the policies of the last 10 years so very loose monetary policy very tight fiscal policy low interest rates and money creation combined with austerity basically because that's created much deeper levels of, of wealth inequality it's made sure that house prices stay high share prices stay high so people have big pensions but that the real economy that investment and that wages aren't actually keeping up with that and the global south of course has been um, very much left out of this of this deal uh, so even though again we're hearing lots of people say well the state is back state spending is on the agenda again the imf says well you know we want uh, we don't want to see any more austerity the imf is still pursuing um kind of quite uh um, punitive uh, debt restructuring programs in other parts of the world and a lot of, uh, of states in the global south have simply been unable to uh, simultaneously meet the obligations that they have to their creditors whilst also uh, doing the things they need to do to tackle the virus because there's this mounting problem of, of this debt crisis as creditors basically say we want our money back. Um, and that obviously means that the kinds of measures that are being pursued in the global north are very much not on the table for the global south and you know, we really need to think quite substantially about the question of, of what's going to happen to Global South debt when this crisis is over. And that becomes even more acute when you think about the fact that climate breakdown is very, very much already with many states in the Global South, whether we're thinking about rising sea levels affecting low lying and island nations, about desertification in places like the Sahel, about wildfires, about more ex frequent extreme weather events. All of these things are very much part of the kind of daily existence of many people who are living in the global south at the moment um, and the access to capital in order to sort to well, mitigate at the very least those problems is simply not there. And a lot of these issues are actually going to get worse after um, after the crisis, even with some of the measures that have already been announced by governments to try and deal with it. One big problem that I think we really need to get our heads around is the fact that income and wealth inequality, again, are going to go through the roof when this crisis is over. Because if you think about it, we've really had a crisis that's been lived in in two halves, depending on where you are in the population. For professional workers who own their own homes and have been able to work from home on full pay, but haven't been able to spend, a lot of them have accumulated very, very big savings. And you've seen um, the savings ratio really skyrocket on a level that we've never really seen before, basically because a lot of people haven't been able to spend money. So the wealthier have been able to use this time to pay down debts, maybe pay off some of their mortgage and also accumulate substantial savings. Um, the rest of the population has either seen a kind of stagnation in their income. So maybe they've been going to work, um, putting their, you know, their lives on the line to do so, uh, continuing to have to pay, you know, many of the, the transport costs or the bills or whatever that are associated with that. Maybe also experiencing a pay freeze um, because they're in the public sector or just low pay generally because they're in, um, you know, low skill, low wage sectors in the rest of the economy. Others who are on the furlough scheme have seen a reduction in their incomes and maybe also a reduction of their outgoing. So they're on that same level. And yet others have um, experienced unemployment. Um, you know, those in the private rented sector have, as, as I said, struggled to um, to make ends meet. Um, and for them, incomes have gone down. So there is this really big divide in how people have experienced the, the pandemic. And what we could see when this crisis is over is those wealthier people who've accumulated all those savings going back out into the economy, spending lots of money, that driving potential short term inflation because um, the kind of the, the, the supply side has been constrained by the crisis. So there aren't maybe enough goods and services to go around. Maybe things can't reopen as quickly as we would like. And that then damaging those who, you know, have not been able to accrue those savings as well. So that's potentially a big problem. We're also going to see rising monopoly power as this crisis um, continues, because that's what you always see during crises. Small businesses go under, big businesses buy them up, big business can get access to state support, small businesses struggle much, much more. Um, and that 
question of corporate power is going to become really, really significant, especially when you look at the US and you see that, you know, the big four tech companies have a, a combined market capitalization that's basically 20 percent of the entire S&P 500. That's an almost unparalleled, that is an unparalleled um, level of, of market concentration in the history of modern capitalism. And what those companies are going to do with that power is really, really a big question. This question of global south debt, again, is not going away. There are no real measures that have been implemented successfully to tackle it. We've got this moratorium, but it's not dealing with that existing stock of debt. Um, and many of those countries are really going to be stuck and unable to recover from the pandemic because they've got this debt overhang um, weighing them down. And climate breakdown, again, you know, we've seen uh, a small reduction in emissions as states basically shut their economies down. But as things kind of get back to normal, that will be reversed. And the big question is, will the stimulus packages that are being announced by states all around the world actually aim to uh, to deal with climate breakdown? It looks as though this is a big priority for the Chinese state. So that's potentially promising. And it looks as though hopefully Biden might do something about it as well. So that's potentially promising. Um, but, you know, a lot is going to depend, as I'm going to talk in, in, in just a moment, about um, the capacity of, of, of working people to organise, to put pressure on these politicians to make sure that A, they're doing something about the climate, but B, that they're not doing it in a way that um, damages working people, either by, you know, destroying jobs in some sectors and failing to create jobs in other sectors, or by um, simply kind of doing it through through subsidies that enrich the elite at the expense of uh, of everyone else. So really, at the end of this crisis, what we could potentially could end up seeing is a much more concentrated form of capitalism, much more centralized form of capitalism with some very, very powerful corporations and powerful states and financial institutions uh, having much, much more control and power over the whole system. More state intervention is obviously going to be needed just to keep the system afloat, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to help working people. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to reduce inequality or even create jobs. It could just be a mechanism to basically do what we've seen a lot in the past of just creating corporate welfare. So using public money to support the interests of private corporations. You can see this very, very clearly with the outsourcing agenda in the UK. So I'm sure many of you will have seen those pictures of uh, the school meals that have been handed out to um, to families um, in place of, uh, of the vouchers system, and they were they were procured obviously um, by outsourcing companies of one kind or another, uh, who will have won contracts from the government to deliver these meals, and they will have done it as cheaply as possible so they can skim all this money off the top. Um, and you know you see this again and again and again in various different areas of um, of you know public service provision of, of infrastructure investment with the the PFI schemes, basically private businesses winning contracts from the state and then skimming public money on off the top only to deliver very, very poor um, services uh, in, in exchange. So these are potentially huge problems that we're going to have to deal with in, in the wake of this crisis, but they're also creating um, openings for organising. Um, I think it's it's quite clear, and we're seeing this in the conversation that we're having at the moment, that the more state intervention there is, the more politicised the economy becomes. So if you see the state, you know, showering corporations with loads of money, if you see the furlough scheme, if you see, you know, all these um, quite extensive areas of state intervention as a citizen, then the argument that we saw after the financial crisis of, oh, there's not enough money to pay for nurses' salaries, but there is enough money to bail out the banks that becomes much, much, much less credible and it creates all sorts of problems. It's in, indeed why you end up seeing um, a lot of states that, that do intervene very, very strongly in their economies, like, for example, the Chinese state being very authoritarian um, because, you know, there is this um, this need to prevent um, this understanding that actually, you know, the, politics and the economy are not separate. It's not the case that you have the state over here and markets over here, but actually that states create and intervene in markets all the time and that markets kind of also shape the way that states work. Um, you know, you need a very authoritarian government to prevent that realisation from translating into much more extensive demands for, um, you know, redistribution and all sorts of other policies that would benefit working people rather than, than elites. And so for me, um, this this question of what we do after the crisis 
how we tackle climate breakdown, how we tackle the productivity problem, inequality, um, global inequality, is really very much interlinked with this question of democracy. I think this is really, really important and it needs to be a really central plank of the Green New Deal. Um, because often the way we talk about the Green New Deal is just, oh, states need to do more. They need to intervene more in the economy. Um, and that is what is going to save us from you know whatever crisis we happen to be going through at the moment. But actually, as long as we have a state that is run in the interests of big business, big finance, you know, big the elites in general, basically, um, its spending, its power is going to be used to prop up those interests rather than supporting the interests of the majority. And that's why democracy becomes so, so, so important, um, because, you know, it, it's not just about demanding higher state spending. It's about creating a more democratic state um, and also creating a democratic economy as well. Um, so, you know, this combines measures to transform the way that, that these states work. So to really embed democratic accountability in all the different parts of the state apparatus. So, for example, democratising the Bank of England so that it can't just carry on creating money and channeling it off to the finance sector, but actually has to be answerable to to working people um, through to, you know, in the UK, getting rid of the House of Lords, getting rid of the, the City of London Corporation, um, which is, you know, allegedly a, a local authority, but which is actually a kind of private lobbying organisation at the heart of our democracy. All these kind of constitutional reforms, decentralisation, empowering local and regional government to make sure that people's voices are very much at the centre of how state spending is distributed and also economic democracy. And this is really, really important. So it encompasses things like re-empowering the labour movement, which has been so important for protecting workers' interests over the course of this pandemic. We probably wouldn't have a furlough scheme were it not for the labour movement and, the, and some of the unions in this country. Um, so, you know, getting rid of some of those very harsh anti-trade union laws is going to be a really important part of that. But also thinking creatively about, you know, new forms of public democratic ownership how we can democratise and socialise finance, create new public and community banks, um, you know, have uh, many of the things that most people want taken into public ownership, taken into public ownership, but then also run democratically. So, you know, um, having, yes, the labour movement, but also direct citizen and consumer participation in things like, you know, governing nationalised railways. All of these different things really aim to kind of dissolve that distinction that is the basis of, um, the uh, the accord between capitalism and democracy that we've seen really over the last century, which is the idea that there's politics and the state over here and there's the economy and markets over here. And you can have democracy here, but you can't have democracy here. And obviously all that does is it means that you have this form of very concentrated, centralised power um, in the economy and that then subverts democratic politics in the in the realm of the state and uh, and you know elections and all those other um those formal areas of liberal democracy that we're familiar with and these 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 policies i think really have to be a central part of what we argue for when we argue for a green new deal so yes we need a massive increase in state investment we need national investment banks we need to democratize the finance sector we need transfers of resources from global north to global south we need to invest in renewable energies all these different sorts of things but we need to whilst doing that make sure that it's being done in a way that is you know facilitates a just transition that reduces inequality that deals with all those problems that i've uh, that i mentioned at the start of this um of this presentation and the only route to that is through uh, democratic representation, because otherwise, as we've seen time and time and time again, those um, those policies get co-opted by the people at the very top. So, you know, you end up with the situation we have now where the government announces um, intervention to support the functioning of the economy and big businesses come in and say, right, we'll have some of that. So EasyJet, for example, um, got a huge loan, um, got a huge amount of support from the Bank of England and uh, then went out to distribute a load of money to its shareholders. And a lot of those jobs aren't going to be safe. And we've seen a lot of public funding basically go straight into the pockets of shareholders without any guarantees about these companies paying their tax keeping on their workers or any of these sorts of things. And the same questions really need to be asked about the Green New Deal. Is it going to be something that is run democratically in the interest of the majority? Or is it going to be something that's going to be able to be co-opted by a small elite at the very top of our society? Um, and I think I've had my time there, so I will stop now and open up to questions. Thank you very much, everyone.
Thanks, Grace. That was that was terrific and really, really thought provoking. We have been having questions coming through. Um, I'm going to I'm going to kick off. I'm going to use my um, moderator's privilege or facilitator's privilege and and ask the first one, I think, which is um, and maybe this points to um, a situation beyond the UK as well. Um, but certainly in the UK, and I guess this is is probably mirrored in other national contexts, although perhaps not currently in the US, but we'll wait and see on that one. So how, how do you go about organising? How do people listening to this and watching this go about organising for a Green New Deal beyond political parties? Is it is it something that's possible beyond political parties? Yeah, I think that's it, it's really, really important because um, too often our understanding of political change centres on just elections. And I think, again, that's the, the function of this separation between politics and economics. You know, we understand democracy is something that happens once every four or five years. And that's when people get to have a say in how government works. Um, and that is obviously not good enough. It's not good enough for a whole host of reasons, both because of, you know, the various different crises that we're currently witnessing in the way that the way that democracy works and really the kind of slide into much more authoritarian forms of rule that we're seeing in a lot of parts of the world. Um, but also because, um, you know, what is going to happen in between those elections and indeed what is going to happen at those elections themselves will reflect the broader balance of social power that is um, that exists in you know wider society um, the rest of the time. Um, the whole idea that it's going to be possible to kind of transform the way that the economy and society works just by electing a government that that's, that's then going to go into the state and change everything was always quite reductive. Um, and indeed, a lot of people who have been involved in kind of the democratic socialist revival of the, of the last kind of five years have said, well, you know, we need to also be acting outside of political parties and, and and direct elections to build up other forms of working class power. Now, obviously, the big question is how you do that. Um, and uh, I um, have, you know, I, I, I defer to people who are much more experienced in actual organising rather than just, you know, thinking um, on many of these questions. But I also talk to them quite a lot about it. And I think some of the most important things that we're seeing people organise on at the moment um, can really be placed into one of three categories. So the first one is making sure that political parties are democratic and, and represent the interests of, of members and wider society. Um, so that involves, you know, within the Labour Party, for example, organising to make sure that policies are put forward at conference by groups like Labour for a Green New Deal that reflect the interests of members. The second one is organising within the Labour movement. So this is really, really, really important um, because, uh, you know, there's a, a whole host of, of evidence that shows that, you um, the, the labour share of national income, wages, all different sorts of things are correlated with trade union membership and trade union membership has gone off a cliff since the 80s in this country. Um, and it's only recently just started to pick up again for obvious reasons, because workers need representation during times like this. Um, so, yeah, organising the labour movement, both kind of trying to strengthen the labour movement from the outside and also getting people organised within the, the unions to make sure that they're more accountable to their members. And then... Finally, something that like everyone can do right now, which is getting involved in various forms of community and social movement organising that are happening at the moment. Um, so like Momentum, for example, is organising with tenants through lots of tenants unions to try and um, like to, uh, like support rent strikes that are happening and also to support people who are unable to pay their rent as a result of the pandemic and building that into a much, much wider movement. There was the, um, the direct action that took place a while ago outside a lot of the banks that fund the the fossil fuel companies, I think organised again by Momentum, um, which was, you know, basically designed to draw attention to that issue. Um, obviously, we've had a huge uptick in direct action uh, when it comes to climate breakdown over the last couple of years. And when we're allowed to protest again, when it's safe to protest again, I honestly think that those forms of direct action are going to come back with a bang um, because people are kind of sat in their own homes watching this crisis unfold, thinking, what can I do? And when we can finally do something again, there are going to be, I think, some really, really substantial demands, and that's going to translate into people actually getting out onto the streets and, and organising. Um, so, yeah, I think those would be the three main pillars that I would say as to as to how we need to organise to, to get this done. That's terrific. Thank you. And uh, I think there's a uh, just my last one, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to start going through um, s some of the, the, the people who've tuned in. My last one is, is about communication, which is I've been reading a bit about 
some research on the psychology of, of climate change and how um, a kind of positive framing seems to be what pulls people in that people kind of get fed up with stories of doing what I love about your um, the ideas you've expressed tonight is it does offer a kind of tangible positive future so I'm wondering if you know you have any advice for people um, people tuning in about how they can communicate with their in their networks to, to sort of further this further this agenda yeah i'm just going to quickly draw attention to the fact that gnd greater manchester has posted in the chat saying for anyone in the greater manchester area interested in this please get in touch at green new deal manchester at gmail.com they're building a local campaign to uh, support the gnd G and would love to have you involved so there you go there's something you can already yeah, do and there's green new deals or green new deal groups all across the country as well for anyone who does want to get involved um so yeah this question of communication is really really important and with climate breakdown it's it's so important because we have this uh this danger that the more we talk about it and the more we emphasize it the more hopeless people become um i had someone come up to me after an event not long ago a young person who was basically like there's nothing we can do anymore i've been reading about climate breakdown and it's it, it's beyond um, the point at which we can intervene in order to change anything. There's no point engaging in electoral politics. There's no point doing anything. Um, we just need to like mitigate the worst stuff. And yes, we do need to focus on mitigation because climate change is already with us, but it is not true that it's too far gone for us to change things. Um, you know, already we're seeing the activism of the last couple of years start to feed into policy. I mean, it's very difficult to imagine that we would have had Biden, for example, pledging $2 trillion worth of investment to, to decarbonize the economy, had it not been for the Sunrise Movement, had it not been for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and all those people who've been campaigning for the Green New Deal for such a long time. So emphasizing the possibility of tackling this when we organize is, I think, lesson number one. Lesson number two is that um, it is important to communicate an understanding of climate breakdown that isn't apolitical. So one of the big problems with groups like Extinction Rebellion, for example, is that they haven't developed a set of concrete demands because they want to keep politics separate from climate breakdown. <clears throat> and it's kind of understandable why they want to do this, that the idea is, oh, we'll appeal to a much broader group of people. The issue is, is that when you depoliticize these questions, uh, it becomes more difficult to understand. Um, so, you know, if you're just saying the earth is burning, we're all equally to blame. And the way that we're going to tackle this is by banning plastic straws and, um, you know, you're going to recycle more. People then say, well, I'm recycling and we've banned plastic straws. So why hasn't anything changed? There's not really been any articulation in that message or as to who's to blame, because it's not largely the average person. I mean, you know, yes, we could all probably do a bit better about like eating less meat and recycling, but like that on its own is not going to curb climate breakdown. What needs to happen is that um, big business, big states, uh, big government, big financial institutions need to take action themselves and they need to be forced to take action by citizens who are you know, aware of these issues. Um, so making sure that we are centering the fact that, you know, for example, in the 1970s, I think it was maybe earlier, actually, ExxonMobil scientists knew about the greenhouse effect. They knew that burning fossil fuels was causing climate breakdown and they buried that information um, and put that money, at, took that money out of their research department and channeled it into fu uh, funding for climate denialism. They're now, legal action is now being taken against Exxon just literally over the last couple of years. But that kind of stuff where you can pinpoint um, the, the people who have really caused and exacerbated this problem is important for getting people to understand why it's necessary to take coordinated political action. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much. Um, I've got a question from Dan Hall, which is a great one, I think, which is what is the way forward if there's a broad consensus on the need for a Green New Deal of some sort, but the branding is co-opted by the right stroke centre right? Um, and I, I could also add to that, you know, this this sort of thing we had in, in the UK, at least, of lots of bodies declaring climate emergencies, but then not doing a great deal um, to back that up. OK, second part of Dan's question. And can you see the vacuum this leaves being filled by a new wave of anti-climate regulation stroke climate skeptics? Yeah, so this whole question of green capitalism is, I think, important because for a while at the beginning of this organising, a lot of people on the left said, oh, you know, we can't fix climate breakdown under capitalism. I think that's broadly true, but there are measures that can and probably will be taken by 
the wealthy and buy you know capital estates and buy big business to mitigate this once they know that it's going to affect them so uh, green capitalism is something that you can imagine but it would involve basically kind of um letting large swathes of the earth that aren't valuable enough become kind of you know basically uninhabitable um, and then only taking measures to uh support um you know the uh, to basically kind of mitigate the impact in the global north and prevent um wealthier countries from having to deal with things like migration that results from climate breakdown affecting the global south and this is something that you are increasingly seeing on the right it's like climate breakdown is with us we need to fortify our borders to stop people from coming in um, as sea levels rise or as deserts spread or whatever and it's you know the kind of disaster capitalist agenda and you know you can uh, you can see this in proposals that center purely on the idea that we're going to just tax carbon out of existence um without putting in place any kind of measures to mitigate the impact that that would have on working people because again the idea is right okay so climate change is affecting us now so we need to do something about it but we're not going to do something about it that's actually going to harm our profits instead we're going to put a big tax on carbon um that's largely going to be paid by working people um and you know that's eventually going to to shift um to shift this uh you know shift this problem obviously that's part of what caused the gilets jaunes protests in france it was the idea that we could solve climate breakdown by imposing the impacts on working people and it just doesn't work um I mean, it causes all sorts of political problems and you know yes potentially that political turmoil gets taken advantage of by the right but that is again why the left needs to be much more organized and able to say look we can solve this problem but we need to socialize production we need to tax the wealthy we need to have collective socialized democratic investment in x and y and z um and it really again comes down to the question of how those messages are communicated and how we organize to deliver those um those uh those um, proposals uh, that really is going to depend which one wins out because yeah there is this growing um, consensus I wrote a piece about it not long ago about green capitalism um, and uh, yeah that could incorporate both a kind of um, disaster capitalist right-wing agenda to uh, expand the security state build borders to prevent climate refugees from coming in with measures that basically harm the working classes. Great so I've got questions. Let's let's take the latest two. So one from Lewis, and I'm going to try to snowball this up with one from Casper as well. So, can you share your thoughts on the World Economic Forum starting the Great Reset Initiative and how will this reshape reshape our society, stroke economy? And Casper mentions Brexit as well. So to reflect on the um, implications of of Brexit for this kind of agenda. Yeah. So. Um right the WEF stuff I mean again I think the the WEF stuff comes in under this mantle of kind of green capitalism um it's you know the idea that all we really need to do to solve climate change is have a couple of big stimulus programs in the global north have a big carbon tax maybe continue with things like emissions trading schemes and um you know do things like responsible impact investing right to kind of allocate capital to um to uh, to the green economy um it's probably not going to happen fast enough it's not going to happen in a big enough way and the vested interests that stand in the way of it becoming something that would you know really work are huge and you saw this you know with the um european emissions trading scheme right this was the idea that we would solve climate breakdown by effectively pricing carbon and therefore allowing institutions to kind of offset the amount of carbon that they were producing by purchasing these um these kind of tokens and of course they were priced because of lobbying completely wrongly um, which didn't really have much of an impact on, on climate breakdown at all. So the European emissions trading scheme has been a bit of a disaster, to be honest. And you've seen a similar patterns in lots of different parts of the world. Uh, you know, you can say the same about lots of different forms of carbon tax. I mean, it, a really effective carbon tax would need to be priced at at least something like $100 a ton, which is huge and, you know, potentially has a massive impact on um, on the real economy and particularly on working people. So yeah, a lot of what is, is being proposed there is, is not going to work. One thing that is good that I think everyone is now basically on the same page on is that the price of renewable technologies, renewable energy technologies has fallen so much that it's just uneconomical to invest in any other form really of energy generation. Um, the issue there is, of course, we've still got functioning, um, you know, dirty forms of, of, of energy generation non-renewables in a lot of different places and they'll have to 
um, play out their lives. But in terms of building new stuff, at least l largely because of um, state subsidies and also of, because of you know research and development in places like China, the cost of renewable energy have fallen a lot. So that is, I think, something that is you're going to see a lot more of in, in coming years. Um, the question is, again, you know, is it done in a fair way? Is it done in a way that creates jobs or is it done in a way that, you know, basically just facilitates um, uh, public money being funneled off into uh, into private pockets? Um, but yeah, I mean, that that is something that that is, uh, is is generally accepted, I think. So that's at least a positive step in the right direction. Um, when it comes to Brexit, uh, yeah, again, you know, so speaking about the European approach to climate breakdown so far, it hasn't really been that effective. We've got this kind of green deal in the EU that is currently being, being obstructed because of all the massive problems that exist within the European Union when it comes to the, the political economic foundations of the bloc that we don't have time to go into now. But that, you know, something vaguely good, although not nearly good enough, was agreed and lots of edges were cut off it by various different states that didn't want to spend too much money. And now it's being obstructed by other member states. And so that may not might not even go through itself. Um, like the UK not being in the EU, um, you know, potentially removes an obstacle to things like more um, more spending to combat climate breakdown, but it doesn't really change the fundamental balance of power within the EU. It does a bit, but like not massively, especially not obviously not within the Eurozone. Um, and, you know, therefore it's, un you know, we're unlikely to see even after Brexit, a massive shift or a massive push towards um, things like a Green New Deal for Europe. Uh, which is which is unfortunate, but I think inevitable given the nature of of, uh, of the set of institutions that comprise the European Union. For the UK, it's potentially worse because I mean it just means that, and this has always been the case with um, with uh, with Brexit. It just means that, and, and this is why the Tories always certain Tories always wanted it is because whichever government is in power. Um, domestically has potentially more power to do more extreme things. So for the Tories, that means decimating, um, you know, tearing up uh, labour uh, labor laws about, you know, working time and all these different sorts of things that we're seeing Kwasi Kwarteng talk about. It means potentially, you know, tearing up environmental regulation, having a really regressive trade deal with the with the US. For a kind of left Brexit would have meant, you know, being able to do much more extensive state aid, impose capital control, socialise the finance sector, etc, etc. But obviously we don't have a left wing government in the UK, we have a very right wing government. And so potentially this means that a lot of those um, restrictions that had been imposed by Europe on emissions and other things could be ignored. Again, it just means that the pressure on activists in the UK is ratcheted up dramatically. Uh, because we have to be the ones that are holding this government to account. You know, the labour movement, the um, the wider like wider left activists, the environmental movement, feminist movement, whatever. We all have to be holding this government to account because Europe isn't going to do it. And to be honest, Europe was never really going to do it anyway. So this just means it it focuses the attention on uh, like on activists actually holding this government to account, particularly when it comes to that question of a, of a trade deal with the US. So no pressure, everyone, but at least we'll have lots of interesting things to research. And then, exactly. You know, yeah, could think of worse ways to spend our time. <laughs> okay, so two questions uh, that are very similar from Fergus and Colin, and this might be the end. So after these, so Fergus asks, is it possible that Green New Deal policies can lead to greater exploitation of a third world? And then Colin has been reading David Harvey, uh, so he's very a man good. after my own heart. Many thanks for a really interesting talk, Grace. Asking with my geography hat on, it's noticeable you flag spatial unevenness throughout global flows of debt, uneven and combined development, and even impacts of climate breakdown and the movement of people, etc. Yet many of the proposed resistances are quite territorial, either national trade unions or local community action. How might we think about organising and building solidarity transnationally in light of all that existing unevenness and difference? Great questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think this is really important because it's something that often gets confused, right? We hear this idea of like global solutions to global problems, which is the type of thing you'll hear at like the World Economic Forum at Davos. And what they mean is basically the little people shouldn't be involved. They mean us who get to go to Davos, who get to exist in these international spaces and transnational spaces, we will set the rules of the game. 
the issue with actual organizing is that it is inevitably takes place in real physical space between real physical individuals um, and that means that the foundations for international transnational organizing have to come from organizing that takes place within a particular space so it you know we cannot skip over the process of building the domestic labor movement of building domestic social movements of you know democratizing our political parties to give activists a real voice um in those and just say oh we're going to try and find like-minded people in other countries because that you know the, the power the foundations to disrupt capital relations which you know can only exist in as i said in a particular space whether you're thinking about going on strike whether you're thinking about um you know a, a protest whether you're thinking about doing things like what xr did disrupting the printing presses all of those things take place in space so the forms of, of, uh, of international solidarity we need require linking up those movements to make sure that they can learn from each other, to make sure they can connect with each other and to make sure that they can build each other up. This is something that an organization like Progressive International is doing already. So trying to link up different movements that are working on different issues all around the world and facilitating international learning, like helping, you know, uh, bring political leaders from some parts of the world to others. Um, and making sure that politicians are aware of struggles that are taking place um, all around the world. It's a similar sort of thing to what I try to do with the podcast as well, is kind of make people aware of, of these struggles that are taking place so that they can kind of support and just, you know, um, and engage in, uh, in various different forms of solidarity. Uh, so I think that's that's the real, you know, it doesn't, it's not the case that just because we have these international problems that we can sidestep the difficult and challenging issue of organising um, within our communities and within our workplaces. We have to also, um, you know, we have to think about international solidarity as, as linking up those struggles rather than skipping them over. And what was the first question you asked, sorry, Owen? Sorry, you're on mute, I think. I am on mute. I didn't want to be that guy. Anyway, um, and Colin corrected me and Dory Massey as well as David Harvey. Quite right. The Open University's Dory Massey, can I just say. Uh, so um, the first question was, is it possible that Green New Deal policies can lead to greater exploitations of the third world? Yes. Um, yes. And this is this is a challenge, uh, both because of the natural resources that are required for things like, you know, uh, electric cars, which rely on, you know, everyone saw that exchange with um, Elon Musk uh, saying we will coup wherever we like. Someone said, oh, you know, you support this coup in Bolivia to get access to lithium. And Elon Musk tweets back, we will coup wherever we like. Um, the implication being that, you know, he needs access to lithium for his electric cars. So American power will be used uh, to, to support his interests um, wherever, uh, wherever he needs that. There are, you know, all sorts of other challenges around here you know if you can think about if we're moving towards a world in which which we obviously are like technological um innovation is going to be more important to um you know limit the amount of, of physical movement of goods and people then you're thinking about rare earth metals that come from lots of unstable regions in the global south uh obviously um you know the move away from oil is going to severely disrupt political economic relations in large parts of, uh, of the Middle East and various other parts of the world. Um, and then, you know, there's the impact of climate breakdown itself, which is already being unevenly felt um, between between global north and, uh, and global south. Um, these are challenges that I think require something that we initially began to see in the wake of um, the kind of de, um, de the Second World War when you had the decolonization movement, which was kind of solidarity amongst states within the global south, but which was quickly kiboshed by the US. So you had things like, um, you know, the new international economic order, the non-aligned movement, which was the, this attempt to get states together to facilitate cooperation and demand better treatment within international institutions and by the global north. Um, so to demand you know, better um, trade rules, better intellectual property rules, all these different sorts of things. All the countries that were involved with this had kind of relatively socialist or left um, governments and many of them were deposed or um, otherwise disrupted by America and other, other foreign powers. There's a really good book by Vincent Bevins called the Jakarta Method, which documents um, the way in which American power was used to destabilize these regimes that tried to build against American power. 
what is interesting today is that we have a, a, a slightly more we're moving towards a more bipolar world um, in which you know you have China as a counterweight to America. The question as to whether or not we see as a result of this countries in the global south being able to bands together and almost play those superpowers off against one another in order to achieve their aims is the big question of I think the next century basically is what will happen um, as American power you know slowly and probably violently declines um, and yeah I mean what we we can I think should hope for is, is solidarity amongst global south states to rewrite the rules of the international economy so to achieve um, you know, much more fair and equal rules on technology, on intellectual property um, to uh, kind of demand transfers to tackle climate breakdown, to, um, you know, change the way that, that trade treaties are written, that bilateral investment treaties are written, get rid of things like um, investor state dispute settlements, all these different sorts of things require solidarity among states in the global south um, and um, really among progressive governments. Uh, and I think, you know, it's something that we are seeing some progress on uh, and I hope that that will continue. But there's certainly a role for movements in the global north to support those aims and to push for those aims. Indeed, you know, um, it was a big plank of uh, of a lot of Labour's recent policy um, was about, you know, correcting some of those injustices that existed at the international level. Um, so, yeah, that is, I think, something that really needs to be focused on. Thanks, Grace. Um, I'm just going to, I don't think we've got time to answer Sam Lucas's question, but I think it's 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 worth getting it out there because he, he makes, um, he or she makes, um, or they make a, um, a, a point that can get us thinking. So um, Sam says, thank you for the enlightening presentation. Would a possible solution for, for democratisation of economics and politics in the UK um, could be a people's assembly that governments would be held accountable by. It would be a long shot due to the amount of control our political system would have to hand over, but would allow Green New Deal to ensure policy is set and currently followed. So advocating a people's a global people's assembly, which is a really interesting idea. Um, OK, so I just want to um, end uh, in two ways. The first way, uh, three ways, there's always three things, isn't there? There's never two. So the first is um, to again thank Grace. It's been fantastic. I was really looking forward to this and um, I've really, really enjoyed myself. The second thing is to flag to people here that we are going to be joined for our second one of these on May the 25th by Andreas Malm, who um, is probably only equal by grace in terms of being prolific, in terms of writing really excellent books and many of them. Um, and Andreas is going to be joining us. He's going to be talking about um, radical ways out of, of Corona. So a similar kind of topic. Um, and we'll decide closer to the time whether we're going to um, keep his framing of how of blowing up pipelines, which is the title of his new book. Um, OK, and the final thing was to just ask you, Grace, because I think people will be interested in what is the next big thing you're up to? Yeah, so I'm actually currently um, working on another book, which uh, will hopefully be coming out uh, next year at some point. Um, and that is the working title is Corporatocracy. And it's basically looking at a lot of the issues that I've been talking about here. So um, how we are increasingly living in an age of, uh, of kind of capitalist planning, where you have powerful states, large monopolies, big financial institutions working together to set the rules of the game and actually kind of determine who gets what within the economy. Um, and that kind of the democratization of, of our political and economic systems is the only way to push back against that. And that is what I'm going to be trying to do for the next year. Although writing a big expansive book whilst in lockdown is, is not ideal. <laughs> No, but really looking forward to that. And thanks ever so much for your time again. And thanks, thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, it's been fantastic. So I hope you enjoyed it. And please do feel free to um, email me some feedback if you'd like us to do anything different in the future. My email address is available, um, you know, publicly on the OU pages and check out our web pages too. Thanks again, Grace, and thanks everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.